Isn't it interesting how in, in Canada there are these specific areas of geography and they can be close to each other, but you, you have these snow belts. Like I'm told like just a few miles from here in Barrie is, is a snow belt. Depends how close you are to the lake and things like that. I was raised in this little town called Exeter outside of London, and we were in a snow belt. I remember there was a couple winters, one in particular, where what we call drifts, you know, a combination of snow and wind, would, would make these piles of snow, drifts of snow, right to the roofs of our houses. And as a kid, I mean, it was it was glorious. Like you dig tunnels in these things. And probably the best part was that church was canceled. And as a PK, there was, I mean, I, it was better than uh, five Christmases. You know, uh, we'd have to get on the, the call and start doing the phone tree thing to get morning services oh, and evening services canceled. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, but... There's only so many games of Monopoly before we started to feel this cabin fever, sick of each other. We couldn't really leave our house, and it was not always fun. Now, times that by 16 months. Um, There's a time just to survive. Uh, there's that line from the poem in Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a time and a season for everything. And for the last 15 months, it seems like most of us are just getting through it, right? For, for many restaurants and small businesses in our community, you know, the sur- survival is the new success. If you can just sort of make it through, you're doing better than most. And this has been a masterclass in perseverance. Uh, And some of us are maybe getting better. And some of us are maybe getting bitter. Um, we, We persevere our way into maturity. You know, we don't read books into it. We don't um, listen to sermons and podcasts into maturity. We have to live it. We, we persevere into it. And, and we're still living through this global pandemic. The, the cabin fever is real. So <clears throat> I'd like to read from the Psalms today uh, a, a book of poetry and music that expresses every human emotion, I think, uh, that there is. And it's not all happy, happy, joy, joy. So why don't we stand uh, today? We don't typically do this for the reading of the word, but why don't you stand with me and we'll honor um, with our posture uh, the holy words of scripture. You know, unlike the Sermon on the Mount, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna exegete this, okay? I'm not gonna teach this. I think so much of the Psalms are meant to be heard as a, as a cry of the heart in pain. So I'm gonna read it over you but maybe you would even pray it as well. So this is from the Psalms. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea. Don't turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. For my days disappear like smoke and my bones burn like red hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I have lost my appetite Because of my groaning, I'm reduced to skin and bones. I'm like an owl in the desert, like a little owl in a far-off wilderness. I lie awake, lonely as a solitary bird on the roof. My enemies taunt me day after day. They mock and curse me. I eat ashes for food. My tears run down into my drink because of your anger and wrath. For you have picked me up and thrown me out. My life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows. I am withering away like grass, but you, O Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. You will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem. And now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. For the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem. He will appear in his glory. He will listen 
to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. Let this be recorded for future generations so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. Tell them the Lord looked down from his heavenly sanctuary. He looked down to earth from heaven to hear the groans of the prisoners to release those condemned to die. And so the Lord's fame will be celebrated in Zion, his praises in Jerusalem, when multitudes gather together and kingdoms come to worship the Lord. Let's try something a little liturgical from a different denominational tradition than ours. I'll say the word of the Lord and you say, thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. You know, it's Scotty's uh, birthday yesterday, 71 years young, yeah. I love that we have teams of, like, young people and Scotty, you know. He has pairs of socks that are older than Sydney. I know that for a fact. Um, You know, it's been said that an individual can live 40 days without food, four days without water, four minutes without oxygen, and about four seconds without hope. Uh, We were created for hope. We were created for relationship. Uh, Not only relationship with a living God, but relationship with people who were created in his image. We long to share our lives with others especially others who accept us as we are. And I think of all of us who um, occasionally enjoy moments of solitude. I'm an introvert. I, I, I do. I enjoy that. But um, I know there are some even who have chosen to live like really segregated lives away from social interaction. But we were created for companionship. And, and when we are deprived of fellowship from others, something is just off in our spirit, isn't it? The psalmist, you know, had reached such a point, I think. And he had no friend to one another him, it seemed, uh, to help bear the burden with him. You know, pity the one. Who, who feels like they stand alone against the world. So now, there has always been this Christian subculture uh, going back to the first century where the model and the expression of devotion and holiness was, was isolation or reclusiveness, right? Uh, those trying to avoid the contagion of the world um, uh, that, that, that unholy people offered. And so there was isolationist groups like, you know, the Hutterites and the Mennonites and some Amish, for instance, individuals like monks. And of course, um, those philosophies of separation have some biblical truth in them. You know, be not of the world. Uh, do not love the things of the world. Be a set apart People, you know, even the model of Jesus getting away by himself. And of course, we would argue, though, that there's a much more balanced response in light of the totality of Scripture. One of these desert fathers that you may have heard of, an isolationist, uh, Simeon uh, Stylites, uh, Saint Simeon, some call him, he garnered this following for his extreme asceticism of the fourth century. And he, and he got so distracted by a bunch of looky-loos who were trespassing in his cave, it sounds like a Monty Python sketch, that he built and lived atop a pillar for, for, for six years. Uh, sorry, 36 years. Uh, you're like, six years, I could do that. 36 years, that's ridiculous. And he was fed by his disciples who lifted baskets of food 60 feet uh, to, to their lofty leader. Um, and then ironically, thousands came to see this hermit uh, listen to whatever wisdom he might uh, yell down from 60 feet. Now, some of these Christian hermits began to question 
the methods and the lifestyle of their mentors. They wondered, um, how, how long can you learn humility living alone? Uh, how can you learn kindness and gentleness in isolation? How can you learn to practice patience unless someone puts that to the test? How can you learn to love if there's no one around to love? Uh, you know, when I first got to Newmarket three and a half years ago, I did this uh, teaching series called Feed Yourself. And the idea was to encourage Christians to, to, to self feed, to take responsibility for their own spiritual growth. It's not ultimately, you know, the church's responsibility or your parents' responsibility. But if the rationale for a series like that is, well, people are obviously not coming to church as much these days, so let's help people not need church as much, um, then that might turn out to be an overcorrection. And that just leads to a whole new set of problems. Uh, maybe the last thing we need is, a, is, in this cultural moment particularly, is a bunch of lonely people practicing loneliness uh, alone with a focus uh, uh, on solo Christianity. Like, is more individualism really the answer? Uh, Robert Putnam is a name some of you will recognize. He's a Harvard sociologist, and, and he made his life's work a study of loneliness. His book, uh, Bowling Alone, uh, famously showed the beginnings of our decline of community in our culture in, in the last half century. Now, more recently, it's gotten worse, according to his research. 40% of us have zero to one confidants, people who, who we can process our pain with. And about half the country uh, may not have one person. The value of our Western individualism has been bought with a very high price, unfortunately. Now, at a global pandemic, um, all that's come with that. Think of how your uh, circadian rhythms are off in, in, in this last year. The, the fallout from all of this, I think in some ways we're just beginning to experience. I think we're going to experience a crisis uh, of people leaving their professions. Uh, teachers, nurses, retail, emergency frontline social workers, people who started, you know, their career, they wanted to be with people, they loved people, they got so burned out from being isolated from people uh, while still trying to do their jobs. Yeah, and nobody wants to hear about struggling pastors because I, I think some people feel, look, if, if pastors uh, can't practice what they preach about the abundant life, uh, you know, we're all in trouble. But Pastors in 2021 are experiencing a, a crisis, lonely, feeling discouraged, feeling uh, under-supported. A Harvard review found that loneliness increases the likelihood of experiencing depression by 15%, anxiety by 13%. It increases blood pressure, increases the risk of stroke and heart disease. I can't, I can't begin to tell you how many people that I've had conversations with who are feeling the deep effects of this. Something is off. Um, they're unmotivated. Uh, they've, they've, people who've never been depressed before are experiencing real depression in these days. I don't know who this might be for this morning, uh, but I wanna say to you what I've told many of them. Give yourself grace. The whole world is going through this and you are in good company. Um, almost everyone is feeling something off, but I want you to know that even if no one else understands what you're going through, Jesus does. He does. You are never alone. And so it, this is the simple message that I want to 
take the whole summer to tell and retell through, through different biblical narratives. I know I need to hear it repeated. I think you need to hear it again and again through the stories of Daniel and Joseph and Naomi and Hagar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and uh, Jonah and Elijah and Paul and David. We are going to hear how there were times where God's people were isolated, were locked up, were uh, alone, stir crazy. And here's what I want us to be confident in, so confident that it'll, it'll just get into our hearts, it'll get into our bones, into our very beings, that in this year and a half of distancing from family and church and friends, we may be isolated, but we are never alone. The Lord God is always, always with us. In fact, we can be alone and not lonely. Um, Listen to what Deuteronomy says. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Jesus has, has given the gift of his presence. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit to comfort us. Jesus himself knew what it was like to be alone and to be lonely. And he says to comfort us, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Uh, the Apostle Paul knew the pain of loneliness. After years of faithful service to the Lord, he found himself in this dark Roman prison. In the hour of need, it seemed like many had abandoned him. This is what he says in 2 Timothy. At, first my, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with him. The Lord strengthened him. The Lord is always with us, even if we can't perceive it. The psalmist says, when my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. Even when those who are closest to us abandon us in, in dark hours, God will remain with us. You know, interestingly, sometimes, I don't know if you felt this, you can even be surrounded by crowds of people and yet still feel that loneliness. You can be in a crowd in COVID even and it can just exacerbate the loneliness. Take a walk down Ferry Lake sometime and there's no shortage of people, but notice the masks or people giving you a wide berth, less people looking you in the eyes these days. Maybe they don't want to be called out for not wearing a mask or wearing a mask. Or um, We've had people not only have to manage a pandemic, but on top of that, experience the death of a loved one or have gone through divorce and separation. Uh, there has been a shortage of, of counselors and therapists as we go through what is becoming a mental health crisis. More on that later. So what to do? Um, this is no panacea. There's no easy answers. No quick fixes, obviously. But, but would you allow me to give some principles here? Principles that I need to practice. So I'm, I'm preaching to Jonathan here. Um, number one, we need to recognize the presence of God, Okay. Hebrews says, the Lord is, is right there beside you when you're alone. Psalm 139 says, there's no place on earth where he is not present. He, he invites us to abide with him. I love that language, the way the vine is connected to the root. We, we learn to cultivate his presence. Invite him into your life. Meditate on the word, his words, let it fill your heart with faith. Second thing is uh, communicate with God. Easy, right? Um, but 
you know, I, I naturally resist anything that sounds like cliched or trite or like easy answers. But the truth is, uh, we need to come back to prayer. Prayer is, is a great comfort in lonely times. Uh, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Talk to God. Uh, let him speak to you. Prayer ain't just for Sundays. Uh, you can talk to God anytime, anywhere, any place. You know, um, there are some people who engage with us through our podcast or through online that uh, live far away. Well, they don't, they'll probably never attend our church. But I've been getting some uh, letters, emails from people. And, uh, and somebody who is on a real spiritual journey uh, asked the question, uh, Pastor Jonathan, how, how do you pray? What a blessing to be able to um, be asked that and to respond. And can, I just want to share a little bit of my response to them, asking, how, how, does, how do you pray? Here's what I said, or part of it. What I'm going to suggest to you now may sound crazy. Hear me out. Since I believe Jesus still speaks through his spirit in 2021, and I believe that prayer is more than a one-way monologue, I'd encourage you to literally ask Jesus some questions. And while hearing an audible voice is not the normative way he communicates, there is a still small voice, 1 Kings, an inner voice, which you may have to discern in time from your own inner monologue. Um, don't start with the biggies, like, Jesus, what's the meaning of life? Or, Jesus, will you prove your existence beyond all reasonable doubt? Start small. Build your prayer listening muscle. Here's a question I like to ask. Jesus, what do you like about me? Weird, right? Maybe you might even want to write down in a journal the stream of consciousness that comes to your mind and to your heart. If the messages make you feel shame or depression or embarrassment, you can rest assured those aren't messages from Jesus. They may be from your own psyche or even more likely the voice of our spiritual enemy, but they're definitely not from Jesus. If the messages feel affirming and loving, uh, you may say, well, maybe these are just old messages from my parents or my healthy self-esteem. I can understand that. But I believe if you try this sincerely, even sincerely and skeptically, it will actually be the spirit of Jesus speaking to you. Start to build the muscle of recognizing his voice. Ask Jesus Jesus, where can I say yes to you today? Saying yes to Jesus is a series of daily choices. It's being, quote, in step with the Spirit, Galatians 5. Maybe you'll feel a sense of, I think I should call this person. And whether or not you're convinced it's Jesus speaking, just say yes to that sense and, and see what happens. The more you say yes... I believe the more he'll speak. Maybe this is prayer advice uh, 4.0, advanced placement. There's a lot of lifetime churchgoers who probably don't practice this. But because I believe you're sincerely coming to this with an open heart and desire to know God, I can't help but think God will honor that. Some other things you might consider, I realize uh, many have trouble finding the words to pray. I know God honors simple, heartfelt prayers as opposed to flowery, flowery, flowery religious prayers, Matthew 6, 5. Maybe it sounds like a cliche, but it really should sound more like speaking to a friend. The possibilities are endless. Uh, and then I, I, I talk about how you could pray scripture, and we've, we've done that before as a congregation. The Lord is Jonathan's shepherd. Jonathan shall not be in want. The Lord makes Jonathan lie down in green pastures. Um, take, take that 
for what you will. It may be uh, a little beyond your comfort zone. I, I encourage you to try it. Third thing I would say as a principle, use your time well. Redeem your time. Uh, loneliness has a tendency to demoralize you. Cabin fever can cause sort of this inertia in us where we can just sit around and do nothing. Binge Netflix. Sometimes you don't have a choice due to health reasons, but, but even then, there, there is a choice to redeem your time. Often, lonely people are not taking care of themselves. Uh, Paul was alone in prison, and yet in 2 Timothy 4.13, he, he asked that they would bring him uh, his scrolls and parchment. It, it was in prison uh, that he got most of his life's work done. The, the words that we read today from Paul, uh, he redeemed that time in prison. Uh, Paul and John's and others' letters um, you know, their greatest impact came in lockup, uh, experiencing cabin fever, but they redeemed the time. This may be one of the hardest things to do in this season. You know, I just say resist the temptation to do nothing. Resist the temptation to fill your time with what we call um, a time killers, you know, uh, meaningless, empty things that ultimately only f- Feed your loneliness. Fourth thing I would say is, is seek ways to help others. You know, again, Paul is lonely in prison, but he never forgot his personal mission and vision to win people to Christ. If you're feeling lonely, could I encourage you to look for ways to uplift others? You know, honestly, if for no other reason than a a pragmatic one, it will personally lift the cloud of loneliness that you are in. Reach out to someone in need today. The last one uh, principle, and I realize this is easier said than done uh, for me in particular, but learn what it means to be content in all circumstances. Listen to what Paul writes. For I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I know what it, what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. How many of us right now are having a hard time with contentment? Um, Social isolation is, is something that we're not made for. And I know people are, are making memes and jokes about, you know, how introverts are doing great with isolation. But as an introvert, can I tell you, it got old real quick, real quick. God didn't make us to be an island. We need each other. Simple things like, uh, you know, being unable to go to your favorite restaurant or just walk around Home Depot. How many guys like to do that? Just wander the aisles. and uh, It's a hard adjustment, and it's, it's hard being unable to see many of your brothers and sisters in Christ or your family, your friends, and uh, it's weighing on us. So here's Paul in a first century prison. You may remember I showed you a, a picture of what that looked like a few months ago. A Roman prison. It it wasn't pretty. And here he is in extreme social isolation saying, I have learned how to be content. Wow. Paul tells us that during his lifetime, especially during his lifetime of ministry as a Christ follower, that he's had Uh, abundant, fruitful seasons. But uh, there were times where he had no money to buy food. There was times where he was on the verge of starvation, where he was shipwrecked, where he was homeless. Um, But through it all, he says that he has learned how to go through all these times, good and bad, and be content no matter what life threw at him. So there are some of us, I know, struggling with Anxiety 
anxiety about how to provide for our families. Some of us are going stir crazy. Some are frustrated that they can't be involved in the activities that bring them joy and, and fulfillment. We are probably wishing we could be content and have that sense that Paul describes. And, and no matter how cliche it may sound this morning, Paul tells us that we can find contentment and peace in Christ. He tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know a lot of, you know, boxers and MMA fighters tattoo that on their chest and they say, you know, I can beat up all people through Christ who gives me strength. The context here is that we can be content in all circumstances through Christ who gives me strength to do it. Now listen, those of you who are watching online or within the sound of my voice on uh, radio or podcast, I want you to know that if you're going to be able to do all things and endure all things through Christ, you first have to know Christ as Savior and Lord. Paul was able to do all things, endure all things through Christ, even isolation, even imprisonment, because he knew Jesus as his Savior and Lord and friend. He always had Jesus, even when everything else fell apart. He realized that Jesus would always be with him. You know, we're not positive who wrote the book of Hebrews in your Bible. Many scholars believe that it was Paul who wrote it. Well, here's what Hebrews 13, 5 says. Be content with such things as you have. For Jesus himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Perhaps um, you don't have any relationship with Jesus. Uh, why, why not come to him today so that he can heal your broken heart? Uh, Psalm 147 verse 3 says, he's the one who heals the broken heart. The broken heart of those who are grieving. I'm going to invite the band to come up. And, and I wonder if you would pray this prayer with me. A, a prayer of loneliness, a prayer of isolation. And uh, whether you're watching at home or here in this building, would you just even pray this under your breath with me and sort of repeat after me? Uh, Jesus, I know your presence is with me, so teach me to rest in you always. When the journey seems long, Lord, will you help me to remember that you are with me and will never forsake me. I need you, Lord, when I have no one to talk to. Be with me through this trial. Father, my heart aches. Please send your comforter to me and take this loneliness away. Holy Spirit, I come before you to ask that you comfort everyone going through loneliness. Give us strength, O oh Lord, to carry on when we are down and out and have no one to turn to. Thank you, O oh Lord, for answering my prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? This is a, such an appropriate song to just offer to Jesus today. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. May you meet with me again. Let's sing together.